Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the People Analytics Podcast. I'm the host, Sean Boyce, and founder of StatGeek. I'd like to welcome our guest on the show today, Emily Meekins, who is the People Operations Lead at Seer Interactive. Hello, Emily. How are you? And thanks for being on the show. Hey there. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I am super excited to be here. So I hear you're calling in from lovely, sunny San Diego. I am. I have the pleasure of spending a week here. I am typically in our Philly headquarters, um, but I, I'm here in San Diego. It's my first time in California. We have a nice little office here with 50 folks who sit here permanently. Um, so I'm out in the, in the little courtyard and, and very much enjoying myself. That is so cool. I have to say your background's a lot cooler than mine. So for those that are listening to the show in audio only, definitely check out the video version because Emily's background is super cool. <laughs> so thanks for being here. As I mentioned before, um, Emily, if you could, for myself and the listeners, can you give us some background about yourself? Uh, talk a little bit about the kind of the work that you're doing today in people operations. Yeah, sure. So um, as you mentioned, I am a people operations lead at SEER, um, which is basically all things people. Um, I'd say if, if I were to bucket my role, probably about 60% is overseeing the talent acquisition function here. Um, another 20% is all things data um, as it relates to our people ops division. So excited to spend a bit more time there. And then another 20% is just like fun, weird, um, special projects internally that bubble up that I get to get my hands on. Um, and, and that takes all sorts of shapes and forms. So um, my role shifts around a good bit, but um, I get to kind of straddle that internal HR and external recruiting side. That's super exciting, and I'd say a pretty good fit for the show, as uh, aptly named People Analytics, like we like to talk about all things kind of people, HR, data on the show. It sounds like you're doing some really cool stuff with it, and we'd love to hear more about that. So I'd love to, number one, kind of get your take on how you would interpret or define people analytics, and then if you could talk a little bit about some of the cool stuff that you're doing with data as it relates to people at SEER, I think that would be very interesting as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how would I define people analytics? Um, it's using data to make smarter decisions about the people in your organization. Um, so in HR, or people ops, or recruiting, whatever um, your organization calls it, you, you likely have a lot more data at your fingertips than you're aware of, or maybe you are aware and you're just kind of figuring out how to leverage it in the right way. Um, so here at SEER, we've been working a lot with our HRIS data, our um, performance management data, and our recruiting data. Those are the three primary systems that we're tapping into today to understand um, the data behind our team and how we can make smarter decisions in career pathing, in hiring, in supporting the growth and development of our team, in making sure that we are kind of succession planning and moving folks up and throughout the organization. Um, at SEER, we are a digital marketing agency, so we also have the pleasure of tracking our time. Um, so we're able to look at um, people who are kind of running way over 40 hours a week, trickling under 40 hours a week, and making sure that we're looking at things like time off against burnout and um, balancing those as well. So we're doing all sorts of fun stuff. Um, we are definitely still in a um, exploratory phase. I'd say like some, some of the data and metrics that we've been working with are a bit, bit more built out than others. And right now we're finding that um, we have lots of stuff built and um, lots of kind of dashboards that are overlapping and who has access to what and how often are we refreshing our data. So um, yeah, we're figuring it out. It's not perfect, um, but it, it's been a lot of fun and there's definitely a lot to learn from the data that we have within the world of people ops, which is pretty awesome. Got it. So needless to say, you stay pretty busy. <laughs> got funny keeping you busy over there, it seems. Uh, you broke it down into three categories. It was HRIS, performance management, and recruiting. I'm curious about all of them. I, I would say, since what we do at Staff Geek, of course, is helping people with recruiting and hiring, I'm curious to know more about all of them, but in particular, recruiting. Like, 
what kind of data are you guys looking at and, and how are you kind of measuring it and figuring out what to do with it in order to help you in people operations? Yeah, that's a um, great question. Um, recruiting is definitely like the murkiest for me right now. Um, and I'd say that I started with like the internal data and our performance data because um, it, it was cleaner for us um, and it was most accessible for me. And I felt that that would be like the biggest punch in terms of how we support the growth and evolution of our team um, versus leveraging our recruiting data to streamline where we're bringing people in from. So I can definitely dive in a bit more on like what I'm working on there and how I'm thinking through it. Um, but I will say that like, that area is uh, a lot more fuzzy than the other two, um, at least in my experience thus far. So right now, I just moved into overseeing our talent acquisition function at the start of this year. And a big question for me was like, what, what are we doing great? What are we not doing great? Where are there holes and how we're operating? Where are we spending time that we shouldn't be? So I had a lot of questions and um, I was moved into this role to really kind of streamline the operations and make sure that it's scalable. So um, last year we hired roughly 70 folks um, with two recruiters, which is a lot. And we were scrambling for a good part of the year. And um, part of my job in stepping into this role is like, that's gonna happen again. Um, and, and that number is only growing. So how can we make sure that our division is set up for success? So when we are hiring like crazy, we're not pulling our hair out. Um, so one thing that we've really been working with a lot, and I'd say this actually, um, maybe this isn't as uh, murky as I thought it would be. Um, so we started working a lot with our time to fill data and looking at from when a requisition opens and when a requisition closes, what is the, how long does it take us to fill that role? And we can do that across every single role that we've hired for in the last three years. And we can then average those numbers. So we can say on average, for a PPC manager, it takes us roughly 45 days to fill that role. And part of the challenge that we were running into is every division across Sierra, again, we're a marketing agency and um, we have a really great grip on capacity. So we have headcount, um, revenue per headcount, and we understand how much revenue an employee can hold. And if our employees are tipping over a certain revenue count, that is then a flag for our team to say, okay, we need to hire a new person. For recruiting, um, it's basically just like, when do our recruiters look exhausted enough um, that like we should probably help them and, and hire a new person onto their team. Um, and that also doesn't, doesn't scale. Um, so we started leveraging time to fill to understand what our average is. And then we use this data to build a capacity model. So we were able to say, okay, based on these time to fill averages, we're going to build a matrix that says, um, on the y-axis, we have frequency of hire, and on the x-axis, we have complexity of hire. So we can say, okay, contractors take us 10 days to fill. They're, we don't hire for them often, but they're not that complex. So maybe we give that two capacity points versus a VP is very hard to fill. We don't hire them that often, but like maybe that has a capacity number of, say, 10 or 12. So then we're able to start using this data to map out our roles against the matrix to understand um, based on time to fill, based on frequency, based on complexity, what is the like number of capacity points we can assign and then how many capacity points can a recruiter hold. So we understand, okay, if you're a senior manager, you're expected to hold roughly 25 to 30 capacity points. And that looks a lot different than, say, like 10 requisitions, because requisitions vary in terms of complexity. Um, and it's not fair to say, Lauren, you're going to hold 10 requisitions, and half of those are senior management. Um, versus someone who's carrying more entry-level junior roles. And that then helps us expectation set with our leadership team to say, hey, both of our recruiters are over capacity right now and, and 
that's okay. We're making do, but all of these time to fill averages that we give you, here's the impact that you're going to see when we're over capacity by five capacity points or 10 capacity points or 15. That 45 day average time to fill is now looking more like 55 or 65 or 75. And it helps us um, at, at least expectation set, especially since we have new business coming in the door that we're then staffing against. That's really fascinating. I'm just like that, the, the gears are turning in my head, uh, listening to not just how you guys really solved a, you know, an HR specific, you know, talent acquisition specific challenge, but that you applied the right process and strategy to it, and then are able to kind of manage the operation better to better meet expectations of the organization based on the work that you guys have done. I'd say that's hardcore people analytics. So it sounds really fascinating. Um, I especially like what you mentioned in the matrix that you've built, that kind of like frequency versus complexity, where it almost sounds like in a development methodology. So I come from the software world, that's my background. And we would measure, we would use like, we call them like story points in agile development to measure the respective lift, given what it is you're going to add feature wise to your software product, right? You come from the agency world, I'm sure you're familiar. And it yeah. sounds like you guys have taken a kind of a similar approach or method applied a similar methodology to understand that like okay every hire is not created equal in terms of the kind of resources that it's going to need the kind of time that's going to take to fill those roles um, so i think it's a really um, fascinating way to go about it through data and it all started with that specific metric you guys were looking to measure which was time to fill right yeah yep very cool so where do you see it kind of going from here now that you have that data how will you use it to kind of uh, move things around in the operation to, to better meet the expectations and the goals of the organization? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we built the model um, and that's yep. great, but now we have to kind of test it and pressure test it. So that's what we're gonna be doing over the course of this year is understanding the impacts of when we're over and under and how does that translate to time to fill. Hypothetically, if we are under capacity, we should be able to fill under that time to fill average. If we're over capacity, we should be able to start tracking trends in terms of what does that look like from a time to fill standpoint. Um, it does get tricky because it's not black and white. Um, if we're coming off of a time where we are 10 capacity points over, just because we fill these roles and we're now at capacity, we're still playing catch up because we were underwater for the past two weeks or month or whatever that sprint looks like. Um, so it's not, um, it's not perfect. Um, and we're going to have to figure out kind of what that looks like and how do we communicate, um, how do we communicate these shifts to people where they, they understand why they're happening and, um, can help prepare themselves for them without always us kind of like prompting or reminding people about the intricacies. Um, but certainly that kind of training and education will happen over time. We are also building a recruiting dashboard. So the data visualization tool that we use here is Power BI. And that's what we've been using. That's what everyone across here uses for our client teams, for our internal operations. Um, that's the same that we've been using for a lot of our kind of performance dashboards and internal things. But also building that on the external side. Um, so we have bi-weekly meetings with um, our BD team and our VP and execs to walk through staffing updates. So we have a dashboard that shows recruiter capacity against the open requisitions. And we're also able to track that over time. So we can see what capacity looked like through every month over the past couple of years and be able to see those trend lines. And those should also, again, map to those time tables. So we can click in and say like, man, for the last half of 2019, we were really hot. And you're wondering why we're carrying 12 recs into the new year, like this is why. Um, so it helps to have that um, historic context as well to really place things. Um, Cause no one is like, yes, recruiting is important, but our, BD team and our VPs and execs have a million other things to think about. They're not, um, what recruiting capacity was like last month is not top of mind for them. They just want the requisitions that are open to be built, which is fair. I definitely wouldn't be lying if I said I have about a million questions for you. 
that is <laughs> fascinating stuff that you just mentioned that I would love to unpack from like the tools that you use and Power BI, how you leverage those for these efforts. I'd love to hear, get a little bit of your thoughts around that. But also that last part I think is really powerful. And I want people to focus on that where you said that like, this may not be top of mind for the executive team and everything that they're doing, but it is critical in order for the business to be successful and to grow in the way in which it should, right? This is kind of like, I could see you like enabling HR and the talent acquisition group through data that says, you know, like you said, right, 12 re open racks made its way into the new year, but here's why kind of a thing. Here's the data story behind that. So you've got that to kind of back it up because otherwise you're just not looking at it very comprehensively. There's so many, there's so much more to it than just open recs, right? You've already mentioned that uh, the lift can be different. We may not have the capacity necessary given that lift. So I'm curious to hear you talk about two things. One, kind of tools that you use to help you in these efforts like Power BI and how that is able to kind of help you gain momentum in the right direction. But number two is how does this help you tell the story to leadership throughout the organization? Yeah, um, so Power BI, I'll start with the tools. Um, Power BI is the primary data visualization tool that we use. Um, it's free, which is awesome, so anyone can use it. Um, there is a pro version, which is, it, it makes it a lot easier to share Power BI files, but um, you would have to have a group of people that are on pro. So um, we do have Power BI Pro within our team and all of our VPs and execs across here have Power BI Pro as well. So it makes it really easy to refresh that data and those dashboards and make sure that it's in their hands in real time. Um, in terms of like what tools we're using outside of that, like that, that is really the big one for data visualization, but we use uh, an ATS as well. So that's where we're getting all this data and funneling it into Power BI. Um, if we were looking at recruiting alone, really, that, that would be it. Um, from like an ATS and Power BI, that, that's how we're getting this data and building it out. If you don't have an ATS, um, you have to create a little system for attracting your own data. Um, and I imagine that like, well, it's probably pretty essential from a candidate standpoint, but also just making sure that you're tracking like, what are the roles that are open? When are they opening? When are they closing? I'd say that that time of metric is the, the biggest one to capture there. And then um, probably looking at that like pipeline speed over time as well. Um, that would be tools and technology in terms of how we are setting expectations with our leadership team. Um, having, having the data is really impactful. Um, so being able to show like, how many candidates are we chatting with? How are they moving throughout our pipeline? Um, what, like who's owning how many requisitions? Um, again, that, that time to fill is a big one. That's the one that we're leaning on a lot for expectation setting. Um, but part of what I'm seeing in the evolution of that is like looking at the pipeline speed. And that's something that we haven't quite solved for yet. I can, I can, do it very manually, but that doesn't scale. Um, so really looking at getting that into our dashboards to be able to show, hey, we're working on this analytics manager role. Here's how many applicants we've seen. Here's how many leads we've reached out to. Here are how many folks are in a nurture campaign. And then watching those folks move through our pipeline to be able to say like, yeah, we may have three candidates to show you this week, but we actually had 10 recruiter interviews and here's where people are falling off. Um, so I think that that is kind of that next phase of visibility. And I, I think visibility is a really big part of it. So it's not just having the data, but also opening up those doors to show where we're spending our efforts. Um, because otherwise, if you're just bringing candidates to the table week over week, you're missing a big chunk of the story and a big chunk of the insights on like, just because we have three candidates to show you today doesn't mean that we didn't talk to or um, reach out to this many folks. Um, and you can also start, start to expectation set there. And that's, I've been doing a little bit of that with my team and looking at, hey, we have a senior client engagement manager role open. And last year when we had this role open, it took us roughly 80, um, 80 leads to make two hires. So I'm saying, um, we have one role open, let's cut that in half. Like 
that's our that's our benchmark um, until we don't hit it and then we'll reevaluate it. So like if you are only reaching out to if you've only reached out to 20 people so far, like we have another 50 to go and here's how we should expect to see that pace over time. Um, so we we're at least keeping pace with what we've seen historically. That's fantastic. My next question for you is something our listeners may be wondering about as well also, but if they want to get more involved in the type of work that you're doing so they can see some of this data and benefit from it at their organization, people operations, people analytics, like what's the best advice you have for someone that wants to get more involved in doing this at their own organization? Yeah, um, just got to do it. Um, <laughs> I think like you, you just have to, you have to get your hands on the data and just start playing around. Um, there are definitely like forums out there. Google is your very best friend. If you don't know how to do something or if you're hitting a wall, just Google it and Google it until you find the answer. Um, SEER, we have like a whole lot of people working in Power BI and working with data and we're, it's just like an organization filled with data nerds and people who love data, but um, all of the data that we work with is like confidential. Um, so I can only get help from people when I'm like, let me talk you through this theoretic, like this, let me talk you through what I'm trying to do, but I can't show you the data on, on what I'm actually doing. And um, that honestly is helpful. Like I, I solve a lot of problems just by like being forced to articulate what I'm trying to do. Um, but I'd say like first, First thing is like if you don't have access to data, if you have someone who's kind of like um, keeper of all of the data, um, try show, like chatting with them and bringing some value to the table, and maybe put together a short slide deck of like, hey, here's where I here's what I'm trying to accomplish by working with our data, um, and understanding like why you don't have access, and if there's an opportunity. Um, for you to, if, if you were able to bring value in these ways, is that a door that they could potentially open for you? I know that some places are, uh, don't want every, everyone on the people apps team to have access to data and, and maybe you start with one data set um, and see what you can do there and try to get buy-in and then expand. Um, but if you have access to data, um, next get access to Power BI because it's free. Um, the only other like, Power BI uh, alternative would be Tableau, but you'd have to pay money for that. So unless your organization has a um, a like membership or, or a corporate account, um, maybe start playing with a free tool and just see what you can do. And um, that would kind of be my, my first recommendation is just get, you have to start somewhere. Um, when I started, I was like, I don't even remember what I was going to do, but I was very ambitious. I was like, I'm going to build this thing in Power BI. And I got into Power BI. I was like, oh my God, I'm never <laughs> going to learn this ever. Um, so like it, it takes some persistence as well. But um, yeah, that, that would be my, my best advice. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time, Emily. This has been super valuable. A lot of great information to share with myself and the listeners. I have two more questions for you before we let you go. Number one sure. is... What resources would you share with our audience, books, blogs, events, tools, whatever, often related to people analytics? Yeah, um, so there is a data-driven HR book that I bought last year. Um, it's pretty great. It chats through different data that you probably don't even know you have at your fingertips. Um, it chats through like how different organizations are leveraging their data, so that's pretty interesting. Um, not super related to analytics, but Patty McCord's book, Powerful, is really awesome. That's one of my favorite, like, super relevant um, recruiting books that I've read in the past year or so. Um, if you're like, man, I really want to get, like, just get my hands on something. Like, I don't really want to read a book. I, I want to be a bit more hands-on. Um, there are like Udemy courses on Power BI that walk you through the tool. Power BI also does like a workshop in a day in different cities, um, Philly being one of them. So it won't necessarily be like people operation specific, but it will walk you through the tool and get you a bit more comfortable with some dummy data. So at least that might kind of break down some barriers that you're setting up for yourself and, and help you get your hands in there. 
Thank you. And last question for you is, who should reach out to you and how can they get in touch? Yeah, um, I always love chatting um, about this, about people operations, recruiting. Um, I am typically in Philadelphia, not San Diego, um, but I'm always down for like video chats as well. So if you are in the people ops space, if you are interested in pivoting into the people ops space, if you are stuck on a people analytics problem and are interested in bouncing around some ideas, um, I love doing that as well. So feel free to hit me up. Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn, Emily Meekins. Um, email works too. It's emilym at sierrainteractive.com. Um, those are like my, my two best professional uh, points of contact. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Emily. I'll include links to both the resources and your contact info in the show notes. Um, and I just can't thank you enough for being here and sharing your advice with our audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of the People Analytics Podcast powered by Staff Geek. If you or anyone you know is a leader in human resources or talent acquisition and would be interested in being a guest on our show, please reach out to me at sean at staffgeek.com. That's sean, S-E-A-N, at staffgeek, S-T-A-F-F-G-E-E-K, Com. We would love to share your valuable knowledge with our audience. At this point, we'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of our show, Staff Geek. Staff Geek helps companies hire smarter, by increasing retention, and combating turnover, all while reducing time to hire. They do this by creating a customized behavioral assessment around your company's unique culture. Armed with your fit tech assessment, you're able to evaluate which candidates are the right fit for your company's culture. Start hiring smarter today with Staff Geek. If you'd like to learn more, reach out to Staff Geek at hello at staffgeek.com or visit them on the web at staffgeek.com.